Let's see here. Thank you. But right, I'm going to share my screen and uh, say what we're going to do tonight. And um, we'll put links as I go into the chat, just as usual. So here we go, sharing the screen. First thing I'm going to do is to um, launch the um, Herrig page. I'll just uh, go ahead and click on the Herrig and share that link into the into the chat here. And um, I did go ahead and update the YouTube channel for last week's um, meeting, and I'll do the same tonight with the video that was just started. And tonight, the subject of the boot camp um, page is, uh, I do think we have enough time to go through the lecture, so I'll do that quickly. But I do want to leave enough time tonight to use the breakout rooms and not get sidetracked as I usually do. Um, a thing about this boot camp is it's on the subject of um, correlation. Um, I didn't change the uh, description there, but it is on the subject of correlation. And um, the uh, the topic of correlation is, of course, very simple. But um, in the script, if if you have time to do it, um, there there is some stuff that goes beyond the very basics. Um, but of course, the page is up there. Let's just visit the page real briefly, and I'll drop the bootcamp page into the chat as well. <coughs> So um, what I'm going to do is just um, launch into the slides and go through them at a good pace. And then um, I think I will walk you through the script a little bit. And I'm going to try to finish in 30 minutes. So I have to go kind of quick. I have to exercise self-control. And then we'll use breakout rooms. Um, and I think what we could do is just attempt the, um, the uh, exercises in the breakout room. That's the spirit of the support session afterwards as well. Those students will be learning all of this from a standing start. All right. So if we look at the slides, tonight is the topic of uh, correlation. It's boot camp 2.3. Now, by my count, this is the eighth boot camp page we've gone through. There are 11 R programming and stats boot camp, boot camp pages. And these, um, these last uh, couple here, 2.3, 2.4, 5, and 6, all introduce the, the basics of very simple statistics, and tonight it's correlation. <coughs> one of the, um, one of the um, tenets of interpreting correlation is that it's interpreted as the association of variables, usually numeric variables. And um, I don't know if you have uh, come across this saying before, but um, this th this is a version of the saying that I'm thinking of is that ice cream sales tend to be correlated with things like forest fire. Ice cream sales are correlated with murder in New York City uh, and things like that. But um, the reason that they're correlated is because there's some other factor. In this case, it's it's the temperature which itself might be a causative agent for increases in human hostility to one another and increases in ice cream sales. And so um, it's this tenet that correlation does not um, imply causation. So what we're going to cover tonight is the um, just what the question of correlation is. I'll just tip the hat to the formal null hypothesis testing framework for that. Talk about the data and assumptions. This is pretty simple stuff, so we won't spend long. The typical graphing, it's also simple stuff, but I'll show a few tricks, uh, in, and especially in the, in the um, script as well. Some, these are tricks in the sense that um, we'll, I'll, I'll show some ways that I typically use R code in, <clears throat> in a slightly more than vanilla way, but I, I use them all the time. I use these little tricks every single day. Um, we'll talk about the tests, kinds of correlation, and the null hypothesis test uh, for correlation, and alternatives. Um, 
when uh, the assumptions of a of a correlation test are not met, we have an alternative test that we can use. So I'll I'll demonstrate both of those. I'll just mention them in the talks, and then maybe if we have time, I'll I'll go through that part of the script, and then the practice exercises as usual. So um, you know, correlation is just a, a quantification, a measure of association, and for simple correlation, we're talking about a correlation between two, but there can be more um, numeric variables. All right, so there's um, there is a kind of confusion that we always acknowledge here that um, the the word correlation has a has a meaning just in average English language, and so the general. Um, meaning for correlation is that of a relationship. Now, I find scientists um, use the word, it's a bit pedantic. Um, I, could, I could be accused of being a bit pedantic for this, but um, I find that scientists oftentimes throw the word correlation around in the casual sense, and, and they might even worse, they might go back and forth between the casual sense of a correlation and the specific statistical sense of a correlation. And uh, for that reason, in my opinion, scientists should avoid ever using the casual meaning of correlation whatsoever. It's easy to avoid. And it just means that there's a relationship between two things. But when we talk about a correlation in the specific sense, we're really talking about this quantification of uh, some mathematical relationship between two numeric variables, and that's summarized in the correlation coefficient. Now we graph uh, a correlation for two numeric variables the traditional way is just with a scatter plot, just like this one. So this shows on the x axis some kind of numeric scale of vegetation biomass, and on the y axis, some kind of uh, numeric scale of what's called um, arth, short for arthropod abundance. This is not a great graph because it doesn't indicate the um, the units of measurement here, but it's just an example of uh, the way we typically graph a correlation. And I could make a few points here. One point is that for a correlation, um, which variable is on which axis doesn't matter. As a matter of fact, typically we'll see in a few seconds uh, what we will call a pairs plot. We'll we'll look at some of these correlations both both ways that are possible for every possible combination of variables. This is a kind of minor thing, but it's important and and it has meaning. the 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 fact that the the axes can go either way has a meaning that we mustn't forget, <clears throat> and that that has to do with that idea that um, no causation is implied here, because if we were talking about linear regression, which we will in, um, in a week or two in the boot camp, we do have a convention for which variable is on the y-axis where we do imply causation using a tool like that. Um, and this one, uh, we can see that there is a relationship between these two variables. As one tends to increase, the other one tends to increase across this axis, increasing from um, the lower left to the upper right. And we would call this a positive correlation. We'll look at a picture of all the other possibilities in a second. <clears throat> so the way we kind of handle these is um, we, we, might have some data vectors like this. So here's a, a vector of a, of a um, numeric variable called veg and a vector of a numeric variable called arth. I think there are 99 observations in each of those vectors. And uh, in part of the boot camp, I ask to uh, take these vectors, read them in to your script, and, um, and uh, try to recreate the figure this figure um, exactly. And uh, we, we just do this and we use the plot function. As you know, the plot function is very versatile in R. We use it for simple scatter plots, but 
depending on the kind of object you pass to it, it might produce different results. It does produce different results. But in this case, we just have a, an X variable, the X argument, and a Y variable defined by the Y argument. We can set the labels for the X axis, the X lab argument, Y lab argument for the Y axis label. Uh, here I've, I, I usually think that it's good practice to avoid adding a main title directly into your figure. There are various reasons for that, and I won't allow myself to digress on why. But uh, here I have just to demonstrate that you can do it. I've set the um, <clears throat> the shape of the um, of the um, symbol for each data point to symbol 16, which is a closed circle. The default one is an open circle, a little bit bigger than this point. And then I set the color to blue. So all of, all of this stuff is just vanity. We don't need any of that, and we would get pretty good facsimile of the um, the data just with this this setting the x and y variables. Now, um, I would like to ask you not to turn off on these equations. I, I've changed my thinking on equations in the past couple of years, not because I've been at Harper, but I think I have seen some some things here at Harper in um, teaching the master's students especially, but also interacting with undergrads and and indeed my colleagues and uh, including you guys. That has made me change my thinking a little bit about um, the way that that I want to for the rest of my career, in fact, uh, interact with people in statistics education. Here, here's what I used to think is that for statistics non majors, that's basically anybody who's who's not specifically studying statistics or math i used to think and this is a popular a popular way of thinking i, I didn't make it up myself i learned it from other other um, statisticians who taught non-majors basically the idea was this i'll say it and i might i might can't help myself from saying it a little humorously but this is basically the philosophy that these guys were teaching this stuff. They can't handle equations. They they see them and they cry. We we cannot give it to them because they can't take it. They can't handle it. And <clears throat> a way that I've I've started thinking more recently is that um I I you know it's been quite a long time ago now, but I once was one of those non-major students sitting in that first statistics class, and I also found equations very challenging. And I, I remember I had a few teachers that just it was agonizing and then I had others that just took the time to explain it a little bit and I could understand it when it was explained to me. And uh, because some of these equations are the foundation of everything else we do, I think sometimes it helps you to understand if we spend just a few minutes explaining them. Well, um, for the for the Pearson correlation coefficient. I say that's the first time I've said the Pearson version of the correlation coefficient. We'll come back to that in a second. But for the Pearson correlation coefficient, we're calculating a variable and we're going to set that variable name to little r. And uh, we might we might have it like it appears here that it's little r of an x and a y, two variables that we just call x and y. And the x and the y are a vector of numeric values. We're going to summarize the association between them into a single number, and the number can take the value between negative one and one. Now, the numerator up here, if you look at this first little um, little um, part of the, the numerator on top, we have an xi minus x bar. The x bar is the mean of the x vector, and the xi is every value in that vector. So this is a vector of the differences between an individual value and the mean. Some will be positive, some will be negative. And likewise, for the y, we have a vector of differences. Some will be positive, some will be negative. Now, the actual magnitude of those differences will depend on the scale of x and y, but let's ignore that for a second. All we're doing up here is taking those vectors of differences, multiplying 
the first value of difference for X by the first value of difference uh, for Y, and we're doing that for every row, and we're summing them, them together. And then we're dividing the whole thing by, what is this? It's the same thing. It's the, uh, th this is the squared um, differences. It's the literally the sum of squared differences. We'll come back to this for ANOVA in a few weeks. So we sum the uh, squared differences and we take the square root and then we multiply those together um, in, the, in the denominator. So this is the sum quantification of how the um, variables co-vary with each other relative to the mean of each respective variable divided by some level of the overall variance sum of squared differences. All right, so when we when we plug those numbers in, we come up with a number between negative one and positive one, and that's our summary of the association. And here the n in the equation is just the sample size, and like I said, x and y are just those vectors of, of numbers. <clears throat> I put in the script, in case you ever are interested, if you have an equation like that, programmatically, um, this this really is awesome for helping understand. I I find and I found it as a non-major student myself a long time ago. It really helps to um, take that equation and convert it to some code. Now, when I when I first started doing this for my my undergraduate bachelor's project, I had a a supervisor who was quite he was known for being quite hard and mean. And uh, he made all of his students analyze their data by hand in their lab notebook. And I, uh, I did three analysis of variance calculations by hand, two incorrect ones that he checked and let me know, and finally a correct one. In that spirit, but a lot less mean, I'd invite you to take that equation and convert it into R code. That's what I've done here. This is the calculation of of little r. I calculated the numerator up here first and the whole thing down here. And um, we come up with a, a correlation coefficient for those two variables of positive 0.61 around that. <coughs> now, um, the correlation coefficient, like I said, is some measure of the how two variables co-vary um, relative to their overall variance. And uh, we make a couple of assumptions. So one assumption is that there's a linear relationship between the variables. So right away, we would have an expectation depending on what we're measuring. If we're measuring something like um, human height, we might expect a Gaussian distribution, bell-shaped curve of those values. And um, <clears throat> if we were relating that to some other body measure of humans within the same individual, like um, foot size, shoe size, we, um, we might expect there to be a linear relationship. Uh, whereas if we were counting something, if we were counting something, we might not expect a linear relationship. Um, and then you know, just the, uh, I've said both of these now, but the second assumption is that of a Gaussian um, relationship for each variable, not not for the residuals. That's what we do for uh, a regression, but for here, it's just the variables. It's quite straightforward. The way we calculate the, the easy way, the correlation coefficient in R is just to put two vectors into the core function as arguments. And again, we get exactly the same value there as we did when I calculated it by hand. <coughs> so this graph just shows some um, nine different values of the correlation coefficient. And uh, we have two different things to look at. <coughs> One is whether the correlation coefficient is, is negative or positive. The top row here shows three different correlation coefficients that are positive, 
0 0.99, 0 0.8, and 0 0.5. Excuse me, I have a cough. <coughs> the second thing we want to notice <clears throat> is um, how far from zero our uh, correlation coefficient is. And the closer to zero, the more like a shotgun blast the um, the, the scatter plot will appear. <coughs> So this is some simulated data in the very center graph here where the correlation coefficient is literally zero. And on each side, this is positive 0.1 and this is negative 0.1 and they don't look very different because the correlation is very low. It's close to one in both cases, close to zero rather in both cases. And down on the bottom row are some negative values of 0 0.5, 0 0.8, 0 0.99. You can imagine if the correlation coefficient was exactly one, the points on the line would be exactly on a straight line. <coughs> now, <clears throat> I mentioned this pairs function. This is the classic Fisher's iris data set. And um, it's a way of making several correlation scatter plots across more than two variables. So if you if you want to just get an overview of some numeric variables in your data set, it, it's an it's almost the first thing you want to do just to get a peek. There's a limit to how many look good at doing this. We'll if we have time look at the um, exercise that invites you to do this with one of the data sets built into R. <clears throat> but um, here I've used the classic iris data set it has five variables in it. One variable is um, a factor that is a category of three different iris species and the, the other four are linear um, continuous numeric measures of um, different parts of the flower for the three irises and uh, what i've done here is i've just used the pairs plot and i've <clears throat> i've used the square bracket notation on the iris data object. This is one of the built-in data sets in R. I've just loaded it with the, with the data function uh, there. And I've used the square brackets notation. Remember, there's the row number. If you leave that blank, it implies all rows. And the column number, and here I've specified columns one through five, the fifth column being that categorical variable. So here we have four continuous numeric variables. <clears throat> set the PCH to 16. Here I've done a little trick, do this all the time. If you have a factor, the names of the factor are a character string, but the actual values are set to a numeric value in R. And because they're set to a numeric value, we can exploit the numeric column of colors of the default palette in R. So here I've set color to the species factor. And then we have different colors on our graph for each species. And we just get a sense that um, down here, for example, petal length and petal width are highly positively correlated with one another, whereas sepal length and sepal width are not as correlated. And we also get a sense here because of the color that the different species are quite different. <clears throat> now, the statistical test and alternatives. Our significance test here is testing whether or not there is evidence that the, um, uh, in other words, our null hypothesis is that the correlation coefficient is zero. When we test it and reject the null, the p-value is less than 0 0.05, we, we would usually reject the null and say, well, there's evidence that the correlation coefficient is different to zero. Okay, so this is how significance testing works for the correlation. We, we perform the significance test. Remember, we could just calculate the correlation with the core function, COR, but COR.test, core.test, um, performs the test. And also remember, uh, I mentioned that um, the Pearson correlation um, is the standard traditional 
correlation that has those assumptions of linearity and Gaussian distribution of the residual of the um, data. But um, if we can't adhere to those assumptions, or if we if we can't transform the data so that they do conform to them, we can use an alternative test, the Spearman rank correlation, the non-parametric version of the test. Now it's a weaker test by which I mean for the same sample size, even if there is a correlation, the probability of detecting that real effect, given that it is real, is lower for the Spearman rank correlation. So we would tend to try to avoid it for that reason. It's a weaker test. <coughs> I, I will tr again try not to digress, but I can cannot even help myself. 10 seconds is that um, Pearson, uh, the Pearson correlation was named after a famous statistician named Pearson. And he was uh, a an older a senior statistician to R.A. Fisher above my right shoulder there. And uh, famously, when Pearson, the older senior professor, published his correlation paper, um, R.A. Fisher was uh, only about um, in his early 20s and he found a mathematical error and he, he introduced himself by writing to Pearson this middle-aged August professor and saying, your math's wrong. Here's the correction. <clears throat> if we perform the correlation test, <clears throat> um, we get output like this. So it's pretty ugly. This is just how a lot of the outlook looks like in, um, in R, as you, as you probably know. And the business that we're uh, looking at here, we, we uh, I'll start to repeat this in the um, boot camp page tonight and for the subsequent ones for the next few weeks is um, when we go to report a statistical test, <clears throat> we, we get a lot of stuff out of um, out of a statistical summary in, in stats programs like R. And all of that stuff that we're getting out is meant to help us um, diagnose the analysis as as the analyst, as the statistician, so that you can take full responsibility for your results. And here we're getting all sorts of things. We, we get a statement of what the test was. We get a statement of what data were used. We get a T test statistic. We get a degrees of freedom. We get a P value. Uh, here, obviously in scientific notation, we get um, the, a statement of the alternative hypothesis, you know, in that null hypothesis testing framework here, the true correlation not equal to zero, <laughs> which is uh, like I explained. We get a 95% confidence interval of the estimate of the true correlation coefficient where we're, um, we're uh, reporting. Remember we reported, um, you know, 0.61, so the 95% confidence interval means that, well, the true population that we took this sample from, um, the, the true correlation coefficient, we're 95% confident it, it lies between that range. <clears throat> but what do we report? Um, the thing we never, never do is we never just copy and paste this stuff. Even, even to show your supervisor, it, you're really not doing your job um, to do that. So we, we tend to summarize it because our alternative hypothesis is about the correlation coefficient. <clears throat> we almost always report exactly three values for a particular specific statistical hypothesis. Okay, we, and some tests we do might have more than one specific statistical hypothesis, but, but for any one, we have exactly three, no less, that we must report at minimum so that somebody else can fully interpret our results. And it, they are the sample size or the degrees of freedom. That gives insight into um, how strong the evidence is based on you know, how big the sample was. Here, the degrees of freedom is 97. Now, each of those vectors had 99 values. The degrees of freedom for the correlation coefficient 
is the number of paired values minus one degree of freedom per variable, two variables, so minus two. So the degrees of freedom of 97 for a correlation tells us that 99 rows. The uh, correlation coefficient is the test statistic in this case, you know, indicated by our alternative hypothesis. So we would report that and the p-value. We would never report it in scientific notation or standard notation, as it is sometimes called. Instead, we would report it to a maximum of one ten thousandths, so 0 0.0001. We would tend not to calculate the t statistic, um, and I'm not going to go into uh, what the t statistic means here, but uh, we would tend not not to report that in this case. So this is exactly how it would look. Um, we would say in a single sentence, probably, um, we found a significant correlation between vegetation biomass and arthropod abundance. We would specify the test. I like to do it parenthetically. Pearson's R equals 0 0.61, just rounded to two significant figures, degrees of freedom 97, p-value less than 0 0.0001. <clears throat> we always round it there because if it's a lot smaller than there, that, it doesn't matter. And it, it's easier cognitively to uh, communicate this. We're at the 30 minute mark, and uh, I just want to um, go back to our, our page and uh, download the script. I'm just going to download it quick and open it for you. <coughs> and um, what I want to do is, uh, let me see who we've got in here. I don't have a, a huge number of people, but um, we do have 14 people. And what I think I'm going to do is, uh, because I want to start working with this, this um, breakout room thing, It'll take me about three minutes to set up the breakout room, so you have to be a little patient as I do it. But I'm going to make three breakout rooms just so we can uh, test them out. And I'm going to put um, have a couple of assistants in here tonight, and I think I'm going to um, let me see who um, I'm going to pick on. I'm going to pick on Matt Butler. I'll put you in charge of one, Claire Waro. And uh, George Wager, I'll put you guys just arbitrarily, the first three I saw uh, in each one, and then other people will be arbitrary, and I'll, I'll flip through them. The idea for these breakout rooms for this tonight will be to, um, <clears throat> you can use the time to, to work through my script or to work through the, um, the boot camp yourself or if you want to uh, work through the problem exercises, that's fine too. You can discuss them in the room. I'll be around, so if anybody has anything um, that's in error on the pages or you want some discussion and lively banter, I'll be floating around and you can just grab me. So give me a moment. I'm going to do the breakout rooms. Let us see here. So I um, think we're good. Here comes the breakout rooms. It'll take a moment to spin up.
Hi, Sophia. Looks like you're back in my room. Oh. Did you do something or did um did um did I do something? <laughs> I have no idea. Um let me try and leave and rejoin again. No, 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 no. I'll assign you to a room. I have complete godlike power. Hold on a moment. Okay, thank you. Okay, here you go. Going Thank into Matt's, Matt's room. Cool. Bye. Bye. I think I'm still here. Uh, it takes a second. Be patient. Okay, sorry, sorry. I'll calm down. <laughs>
Are we still in the group? Not sure what happened there. Ed, are you there? I don't know. Yes, he is. He's on hold. Uh, and it's Joe. What's going on? <laughs> I've. I don't know what happened there. Me um, neither. Uh, I'm still not well versed on Microsoft. No, I, I don't know what's happening with the rooms. But Ed, I don't know if you can hear us. But when, when it said like there was an announcement, but we couldn't work find the announcement. Mm -hmm. Uh, oh, hang on, I'm getting a text. That's not it, is it? Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's just us then, I guess. Um, don't know what's going I, on here. We were, were we kicked out of the other <laughs> group, or what happened? <laughs> uh, oh, hang on, do we? Oh, hold on, here's a, here's a message. Ah! Uh, well, guys, that is it. Come on over us. Ah, so it's it's done. We've finished. OK. So it's oh, just, so we need to get to another meeting. Yeah, ah, probably. Yeah, OK. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, <laughs> guys. Bye. <Yeah>. OK, <laughs> bye. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs>